Hi, everyone. Welcome to our last book forum event for the fall 2022 semester. Um, I hope everyone's doing well and December isn't treating you too harshly as we uh, get close to the new year. Um, I'm Nargis Wajjofli. I'm one of the co-directors of the SICE Rethinking Iran Initiative at Johns Hopkins University. And it's a pleasure to be here with you all today and especially to have our guest, um, Dr. Aslad who I'm really looking forward to introducing and having the conversation with today. Uh, we'll be discussing her new book, The State of Resistance. Uh, Dr. Assad Raj works on research and writing related to Iran policy and U.S.-Iran relations. Her writing can be seen in Newsweek, The National Interest, The Independent, Foreign Policy, and uh, more. She has appeared as a commentator on BBC World, Al Jazeera, CNN, and NPR. She completed her PhD in Middle East history from the University of California, Irvine in 2018, and is the author of the recently released The State of Resistance, Politics, Culture, and Identity in Modern Iran, which I have right here in my hands with lots of highlights and underlines. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. It was just published a few months ago, actually, by Cambridge University Press. So first of all, welcome, Asad. It's really Thank nice you. to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. So. Um, this book is a really interesting study of the ways in which nationalism and national identity are formed and narrated throughout modern Iranian history, both from the top down. So you pay a lot of attention to the writings and the publications and the speeches of whether it's Muhammad as a Pahlavi, the previous Shah, or Khomeini, or other folks around uh, him in the lead up and post-revolutionary moments in Iran. But then you also do a lot of work in later chapters looking at ground up either resistance to top-down nationalism or ground up sort of counter narratives um, to the building of what a national identity is in, Iranian, uh, in, in the Iranian state. But what I wanted to first start with is that you, um, I think really well, and I was, I, uh, Asa and I were talking about this before, I was telling her that um, as I was going through this book, I was texting a lot of my friends who teach uh, Iran in universities and telling them how great of a teaching book this is. And I really do believe that. I think this is a really great book to have in classrooms, whether on the undergraduate level or even graduate level for like an introduction to Iran and, and nationalism sorts of courses. Um, and the reason I say that is that you do a really great job at distilling um, theories of nationalism and nation building from Benedict Anderson to Eric Hobswan in, in, in your book. And so I wanted to get us started there, which is, um, first of all, what brought you to write a book and to do research on nationalism in Iran? And then what, what is the work of these theorists doing for your work here? Well, it, my experience, like my sort of process in wanting to write this book was actually quite personal because, and it started almost 20 years ago, um, when I, I was born and raised in the U.S., my parents are immigrants from Iran, but when I, you know, I felt very, very tied to my own, you know, Iranian American, my Iranian heritage, right? I felt very tied to that identity. I felt very Iranian. And then when I visited Iran as an adult, and I did so without my parents. I'd only gone as a, as a child with my parents very few times. And then years later, um, in my early 20s, I visited as an adult. And I thought, you know, I'm, it, it, was, it was this notion of, you know, you're going home. That's the idea that people have a, a lot in diaspora. And when I went, I realized I, was, I had, didn't understand the contemporary Iranian society. And what I thought I knew of Iran was so different than the Iran I actually experienced when I went there. I was very, very different from my cohorts and my cousins and you know friends and family and people who were there. So to me, that was sort of a mind blowing experience, like experiencing culture shock in the place that you would think of as the closest thing to your own identity and culture is what really got me curious about studying Iran more and, and understanding how we're tied to those identities. And when you read someone, I mean, you know, Anderson and Hobsbawm are like the, the fathers of talking about nationalism and national formations, um, the formation of nation states. And the idea of the formation of nation states is something we sort of take for granted, right? In, in everyday life, um, on average, maybe in academics, we talk about it a lot, but for the average person, their identity and they're tied to their national, to their national identity 
is like an everyday thing. They don't, they don't consider it a construction. They don't, we don't think of our identities that way. And I, since I personally experienced that, I thought it was something that would be interesting to study. So when you looked at, you know, when you look at someone like Anderson and you look at the idea of the imagined community, that's very much what I felt. I felt like I had imagined this connection that I had. Um, and once I was there, that connection wasn't as strong and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, not as strong because of the emotions. It wasn't as strong because I simply didn't understand things in the same ways that people, especially people who had grown up there, understood them. And so I became fascinated with sort of understanding um, not only my own ties and that of individuals, but just this notion of how national identities form, how there are such different narratives within, within the state. Um, one of the things you experience when you're outside of the country, too, is oftentimes not just Iran, but then you realize that this works across the board. There's these binaries and identities very often, not just national identities, but just identities in general. We tend to make things very, very black and white, especially when we're talking about or thinking about something that's other than ourselves. There's always a little bit more space for nuance when you're talking about your own group and, and your own identity. But when you talk about anything that's outside of that, things become very, very black and white. But then when you're immersed in it, especially in Iran, what I experienced was so much plurality, so much diversity um, of thought, of political thought, of identity, of social thought. Uh, and that was something that I really, really wanted to explore. And you have the reason I looked at state narratives versus what you know popular culture and, and how sort of engaging with people and how they thought about it is because state narratives are very much intended to silence the, that diversity, right? State narratives want to support a very specific uh, story of the nation that supports the, the identity that they are trying to convey because that's, you know, that's the, that's the nature of these national narratives. And that's what one, was one of the things that was interesting also in reading, in reading Hobsbawm and, and Anderson. What I, what I really liked about Hobsbawm, there was one sort of just, sentence that he may have even written in passing, right? It wasn't like the central thesis, but to me, it stuck out so much was this idea that you can have nationalism without a nation. Like you don't actually have to have a formal nation, but you can very much, people can form these national identities and have very, very strong ties to those national identities in the absence of the nation state itself. But the reverse is, is less likely, right? To have a nation state with no nationalism. And so the idea that that was tied to this idea of the modern nation state project, I thought was especially fascinating in the Iranian case because of the attempts of over the last century of these two very, very different powers, whether it be the monarchy or the Islamic Republic to really wield those narratives to their advantage. Yeah, that's um, really interesting. Cause you know, one of the things I talk a lot about with my students when I teach Iran is how it, one of the things that draws me to studying revolutionary societies, whether Iran or other places, is that you can see a lot of these things unfold in a um, very sort of both each time a revolution happens a new way, but also a really pressurized way that like for nation states or national projects that have sustained over a longer period of time without these revolutionary appeal upheavals it's a, it's a drawn out process that's a little bit harder to sort of pinpoint but what you've been able to do in this book by looking at both the path of the era and the islamic republic is um attempt to uncover the ways in which each of these projects was utilizing different senses or different places of Iranian identity to make a claim over a certain kind of nationalism that also in your book you talk a lot about it being tied into questions of anti uh, uh, into questions of colonial anti-colonialism and, and sort of moments for for the desire for sovereignty um so how you know as you were because you came you came into history from a psychology background Right. And so yeah. how how does that background influence the types of questions that both you were interested in and the ways in which you began to explore this field? Well, the psychology behind it was was also fascinating. Right. So national identity is just one identity that we that human beings tie themselves to. Um, but we can see in so many different iterations. I mean, if you look at identity politics today, right, why is it 
such a, a heated kind of conversation to have because people are deeply, deeply tied to these identities. And so the psychology behind it is the fact that there's this need for that. There is clearly some you know, evolutionary or innate need that people have to have these in-groups, to have this sense of identity um, because it, you know, it, it helps to sort of relieve certain types of anxieties that human beings have. But then when you look at the academic side of it, when you look at the, this concept that whether you're talking about race, whether you're talking about nation states, even today when you people talk about gender, the idea that all of these are constructs um, is fascinating within the academic world. But again, in people's everyday experience, that's not how people think about things. They don't think about things as, well, this is my constructed identity, or I'm selecting from a repertoire of symbols. Like this is not how ordinary people think about things. But then when, when I wanted to, and that's why I use popular culture. When I wanted to look at it, I wanted to be able to sort of have this uh, academic discussion, have this discussion about identity and, and breaking it down and really understanding what it means for it to be a construct, what it mean And to me, what it meant wasn't that, because sometimes when you say that, people take it as, oh, it's not real, it's not authentic. And that's not really the debate. The debate isn't that these experience, how people experience these identities are very, very real. It's, it's visceral for them, right? The reactions that they have to certain things. I, myself as well, I'm not, when I speak of people, I'm not removing myself from that equation. Um, even in writing this book, it's one of the things I think I, I tried to say in the preface is like, you have, there are inherent biases and in everything and everything that we, we, we do and we write about. And so when I am writing, I'm not just writing as like, you can try your best to, to remove yourself as a subject, but especially when in a certain way you are a subject, right? In this case, and I'm, if I'm talking about Iranian national identity, I tried to focus the lens very, very squarely on people inside of Iran and separate the diaspora because it is in fact a very different group and should be treated as such, which I note in the book, but it's still difficult not to in certain ways insert yourself. So that's part of that psychology as well, that as much as you try to remove yourself, you're still you're still seeing it through a very, very specific lens because you, you can only see it through, through sort of your own lens. But to my mind, trying to, it wasn't a matter of finding an answer, right? It wasn't like, um, and there are theorists who talk about this like Truro. It's not like there is a very clear, this is the correct national identity, or this is the correct way of looking at it. And that's, and that's the thing that we want to avoid, because that's not the case at all. What's fascinating is these competing narratives and how they compete, especially over time, how you have this sort of um, repertoire of symbols. And that was another key thing, right? The, the reason why I say it's constructed, but it's not fake is because you couldn't construct an identity that wasn't based on symbols that people understood. People have to understand those symbols. They have to be meaningful for them. So you can't create something inorganically. The process is organic, but it's always selective, especially when it's coming from the top down. Whereas from the bottom up, the reason why it could be less selective is because the bottom up is can include everyone. You can include so many different voices when it's from the bottom up because all of those people can be included. When it's from the top down, it tends to be one narrative that attempts to unify all of these people within all of this diversity under one umbrella. And that's what makes it more narrow from the top down. Right. And you, you write about that when it came to Mohammed Reza Pahlavi's, his own writings and attempting to construct a national narrative about how he envisioned Iran to be. And one of the things that you talk about is how that was disconnected from a lot of the, the notions coming from the from the bottom up and that potentially, whether it was his education abroad or whatever it may have been, but that he was pulling on certain ideas and symbols and, and even textual sources that, that were not coming from the bottom up. And this disconnect ultimately becomes something that, um, you know, it becomes his Achilles heel in many ways. Um, so, sorry, please go, no, no, no. Say, you know, um, because I think to a certain extent, the, the process is the problem itself, right? He's trying to create this uh, this idea, and especially for the Pahlavis, it's a different challenge than it is for the Islamic Republic because the Pahlavis are trying to create the infrastructure of modern Iran at the same time that they're trying to create this identity, right? And what do we mean by a modern nation state? Um, under his father, you have, 
you know, conscription, last names, passports, birth certificates, the national language becomes Persian, secondary schools, all of these things are the, the markers of a modern nation state. But in order to do so, why do you have, for instance, a national language? Why has Persian become like the national language that is when Iran has diverse uh, languages, diverse ethnicities, because that's what marks the modern nation state, right? Everybody has to sort of fall under some common umbrella. That's what brings the nation state together. Um, and so you have them simultaneously trying to construct the narrative in which everyone belongs to while creating the infrastructure at the same time. And, and that that is a, I would say that that's a difficult challenge in and of itself because you're trying to do two things simultaneously. Um, but in doing so, you know, in, do, in creating the narrative, I do think a lot of it comes from, like I said, the individual is very difficult to remove themselves. And so it's not a coincidence, the types of narratives you see based on the backgrounds of the people who are who are creating or at least capitalizing on certain elements of those narratives. So the fact that, you know, it's very obvious that a, why would a clerical class use Islam as their the sort of cornerstone and foundation of Iranian identity, because that's what they identify with. Whereas in the case of, but that's something when you use re religiosity and you have a religious population, you have an easier time maybe finding people, at least at the time, that where that message might resonate. Whereas when you come from a background, especially a, a monarchic background, um, someone who was educated in Europe, someone who speaks, you know, English and French in many of his interviews, while that might resonate with a certain group of people, the larger mass won't necessarily be able to identify with it because those aren't their experiences at all. And so you to a certain extent, you sort of can't fault him for bringing his own lens and his own experiences to the table. Those are the ones that he had. Right. And and this is what I really appreciate about your treatment of, in general, looking at nationalism throughout modern Iranian history in the 20th century and into the 21st, is that you yeah. are very much in the um, footsteps of uh, Michel Rothschild, not attempting to write the history of Iran, but you're actually attempting to uncover the various narratives and even more fascinating, like as Shrio attempted to do as well, the, the competing and contesting narratives are ones where it's really rich at that point because your work and, and this is what, I, I mean, as an anthropologist, this is why I really love the way that you treated this is that you are very much a social histor historian in this way in that you're not trying to say this is the history of, of modern nationalism in Iran, but you're saying let's take these con contested views of what nationalism and national identity even are, and that's where we need to look, and that's where we need to sort of trace those out and um, and see what those competing narratives even do for us and, or tell us in a deeper sense about this place that, that we're looking at. So can you talk a little bit more about what drew you to Trio? What his work is doing for you in this book and sort of that lens of, of looking at, at this at, at, uh, nationalism and national identity in Iran. Well, that was exactly what drew me to, to that writing, right? It was the idea that it wasn't, the work of the historian wasn't to give you an answer. It wasn't to say, this is the correct narrative or this is, the, this is why this is incorrect or inauthentic. It was about understanding that these competing stories exist, understanding why they exist and looking at the repertoire of these, of these narratives um, and trying to fill the silences, understand why silences exist in certain situations and why when, especially in the case of Iran, when different powers take over, uh, they, while they, while the Islamic Republic or uh, co-opted the language of the revolutionaries and tried to create this facade of being this open society that represented Iranian people, it also did the same went through the same process of silencing that the monarchy did, right? It, it did the same things. It just reversed the narrative. It just, what it chose was different, but it its actions were the same. And so to me, what trying to understand those silences, what was left out of the story was especially important, not just what was in the story. And going back to the, the psychology behind it, I look at states, right? These state narratives uh, or just how states act as people when we don't do that very often, right? We don't think of them. We don't think of state actions as the same things or the psychology of a state as the psychology of a person. And yet, if you look at individual narratives, Right. Why? Why would it make you would never make sense for you to be like, what is this? 
if you look at your own individual life, you there's so many stories. There's no one story, right? Any story you tell will leave out so much of that life history. And that's just of you, the one individual person. Now imagine a state where you have millions of people within that state that come together to create a story. And you have the, especially in the case of Iran, you have this very long history, right? What's tied to the symbols that are used go back thousands of years. So, uh, and not all nation states have that kind of history to pull from. Not all contemporary nation states have the same history to pull from. So, so there's so much that can be symbols uh, within that narrative. And to me, that was the, the really interesting thing was not to look at, you know, this is, that was never an attempt. It was never to be like, what is the real, what's the authentic identity or what's the authentic, even history, right? Because what is history, the way that we tell histories are essentially stories as well. Um, you know, there's always the phrase, the victors, it's the, the victors who write history. Um, and so to me, even when you're writing a history, you're still, I am still participating in that process of silencing certain things. I'm still selecting. And I thought it was very important to make that point that um, even as I write, I can only, you know, I'm selecting what I'm writing, what which quotes I'm pulling from, whether it's Muhammad Reza Pahlavi, whether it's uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, whoever it is that I'm pulling from, obviously I'm reading through all of these archives and I'm picking what I'm going to put in because it, uh, because it relates to the topic that I'm writing about. So that process of selection, that process of silencing was in my mind, much more interesting to look at than trying to sort of find an answer, if that makes sense. Yeah, makes total sense. And 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 um, I mean, I'm very much a, a reader of trios, so I'm. I, it makes total sense to me, and it's also a very, um, especially. I mean, he he's writing in the context of Haiti, but you know, even when you look in a context like Iran. Um, and especially with the experience of the revolution and just political violence and political upheaval in general and all the silences that end up happening, whether it's through death and war and violence itself or through um, a uh, sort of destruction of archival material, which we had a lot in the, in the uh, aftermath of the revolutionary period, that both creates a certain kind of silence when it comes from the archives, but it also then, as you're saying, the state itself, and then on the other hand, people too, are by very much what they are choosing to use for nationalism are silencing other potential um, uh, uh, stories or other potential avenues to sort of explain the same thing. And that I wanna get to how you, um, how you write this book and the types of material that you use. So you are, as we've sort of talked about up until now, you're very much using both uh, state telling of nationalism, uh, whether it's the pre-revolutionary, post-revolutionary state, as well as then popular culture and the ways that these are contested with one another. So can you talk a little bit about that? How did you um, the sources that you end up using and why it was important for you to, to put these things in dialogue with one another? Well, the sources from the top down were fairly obvious in the sense that, it, you know, you wanted the people who, and it's not to say that those were the only people who were influential, right? Um, Muhammad Reza Pahlavi is not the only person who's influential in that period, but why do I focus on him? Because he's the symbol of the state, right? He, I mean, very, he's directly asked at times, like, what is the, uni what unifies Iran? And he refers to himself as the monarch. That's that's the unifying, that's like the umbrella that everybody falls under. So when when individuals make themselves the symbol of the state itself, um, then what they say is so important in what that narrative of this, they are, they are representative of that state. And so for the state, I tried to use, um, obviously in the case of the monarchy, the monarch himself more than anything else. And then in the case of the Islamic Republic, I weighed heavily on, First, the discourse of the revolutionaries, right? Because they, many of the architects of the revolution come to take power in the in post-revolutionary Iran. Um, of course, in, in the same process of silencing, silencing a lot of the other people and a lot of the other groups, basically every other group that was involved in the revolutionary process, silencing all of those stories once they take power. But uh, 
during the revolutionary period, you also have people who aren't necessarily, they're, they're ideological architects of the revolution, but they don't take power after the revolution, right? Whether they're uh, writers like Al Ahmad or whether there's someone like Shariati who dies before the revolution, but their ideas are still important within that revolutionary discourse. So it's looking at, even bef before the revolutionary period, I tried to look at some popular culture, right? I look at popular culture because I think it's the closest lens you can have to, you can never, there's nothing that represents everybody. There's just no such thing, right? There's no individual, there's no state, there's no uh, film or book that can represent everyone in such a large and diverse country. But at least when you look at pop culture, you can get an idea of, of patterns, or you can get an idea of what, well, a, a, sig a significant portion of the population um, or that resonates with the population. Uh, something to keep in mind though, is what is popular culture? It also depends on those groups, right? It's not like there are uh, there are subsections within every society and within those categories, something will resonate more and something will resonate less. So keeping all of those things in mind, that is part of the process of how I selected the things um, that I wanted to, to look at and understand. So I wanted to see what the state had to say, but then I also wanted to see how people were receiving this information and how they were not just um, agents of form of like forming these identities, not just through their their actions, but through their consumption, right? Especially in popular culture, I mean, like people who make music or people who make films and television, they're doing so because they want it to be popular. They want it to be well received. They want people, the more people, to listen to it and to consume that culture. So it's not just through the habits of what people outwardly express themselves, but through what they consume, they are expressing something. And so that's why I looked at things like pop music. Um, you know, what do, what, what, and a lot of it came from field research because I was in Iran for such a long period of time um, and would go back and forth. It was, you know, I wanted to take like a sort of multidisciplinary ap approach to what I was doing. Uh, historians often don't deal that much with the contemporary where they can do field research, right? Field re they do archival research because they're always dealing with the past. But I wanted, I wanted to look at the past in a way to understand the present more. Because like I said, my initial, what fascinated me initially was my own experience. I went there and thought, oh, I know everything about this country. And then I was like, oh, wow, I know nothing about this country. I should probably learn about it before assuming that I knew so, so much. Um, and once you start doing that, once you start immersing yourself in, in that place, both learning the language and trying to understand the society better, um, and really consuming that culture with them, consuming that popular culture with them, going to the movie theater, watching the films they're watching, watching the television that they're watching, that becomes a very, very different experience. And so I wanted not just to be, uh, not just to be an observer, but to be one of the consumers as well. But of course, my, my interpretation of it personally would be very different because again, as part of the diaspora, the way, the lens through which I see those, that popular culture is very different than someone who, you know, grew up in Iran. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you and and I noticed especially towards the latter half of the book when you're dealing with the contemporary moment, you do a lot of interviews and, and you include that in here, which um, you know do, does sort of makes this very much a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary sort of book because you're looking, you're engaging in so many different kinds of methods to put this book together and to put this research together, which I think is part of you know the way in which it makes it readable as well as, um, and that I also appreciate because it's not, you're not just being loyal to one viewpoint of, or disciplinary viewpoint and research, but, um, but are kind of understanding that by taking a multidisciplinary approach, you can get at so much more here. Um, yeah, to be honest, so, was, please, yeah. I was gonna say, to be honest, it was fun, right? Like it was why, I, you know, it's to be able to do research and for that research to be, watch a lot of films and watch a lot of television and listen to a lot of music is 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 quite fun and that's why i i hoped that my own genuine joy in in exploring these things would come across in the pages right that it wasn't just it wasn't just an exercise in you know sort of like intellectual thinking it was an exercise in really genuinely trying to trying to understand myself trying to understand and then trying to um, distill that understanding for a larger audience. Yeah, yeah. Um, the 
you, I mean, as we've talked about, the centrality of your book is about the nation state and nationalism as both a top down process and a bottom up process. Um, Up until I think fairly recently, meaning in, in, in the past maybe five years or so, there was this overarching narrative, and you can disagree with me, but I've sensed this overarching narrative in um, sort of analysis, not just about Iran in general, that um, transnationalism is much more important than nationalism now, that we've sort of moved beyond the the nation state, or we've moved beyond nationalism as a driving force of our politics. I think the past few years have shown that to not be the case, but I am I want to ask you about the driving force or, or the, the salience of nationalism in a uh, political moment that we're all living in, in which there are many more attempts at trying to think about things transnationally or cross-nationally, but yet there is something about national identity and nationalism that pulls us back in. And by us, I mean, you know, populations as a whole. Can you describe how, you know, th- or think aloud with me about that itself, the, 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 um, the pool of that, and then how that sort of, because then I want to bring us into the contemporary moment, right? And, and how, um, how we sort of get to this moment when th- where there's now a resurgence of nationalism pretty much everywhere that we're looking across the world. Yeah, so Iran was a case study for me in in a certain way, right? Um, It wasn't, I mean, I was obviously focused on Iran, but in my my sort of original studies of nationalism and nation states, uh, I was looking at at the Middle East more um, more largely, like the entirety of the region, but even outside of that region, the idea that I think sometimes the academy runs runs away with an idea with, and, and society has not caught up to, to that sort of notion, right? Um, but the idea that nations, because I, I agree with you 100%, right? I, I know that within the process of, of being in school and learning, there was a lot about, you know, everything is transnationalism and nationalism is really, is really dying out. And that just wasn't what I experienced personally or what I was seeing as a researcher. I'm like, this is not, it seems quite the opposite to me. I'm like, if anything, Mm -hmm. we're very, very deeply tied to those national identities because um, we have not transcended those borders yet, right? That's how we Mm -hmm. think politically. That's how we think every day. Uh, Yes, we've created, and by we, I mean like human society has created um, institutions that are international, right? We have international institutions that have now existed in different iterations for close to a hundred years. Uh, well, I mean, technically, if you include the League of Nations for for a hundred years, um, but but they don't resonate with people in the same way. We still see things very much as we measure everything by the nation state, still, right? Mm-hmm. So you had, for instance, the the COVID pandemic. Here you have. Uh, a global phenomenon. You have a global crisis um, that clearly transcends borders, right? There's no, there were no borders for COVID. Everybody, every state was affected by it. Yet, if you look at the way that we interacted and the way that we talked about it, everything was defined by the nation state. It was how every nation dealt with it. And so those are, this is still largely and by far how not only human beings on an everyday level interact, but how we interact how power interacts. Power still interacts Mm -hmm. through nation states. We use international bodies, but they're very, they're still quite secondary to the nation state itself. And then how those bodies actually can, can be effective, can have accountability is still based on whatever, whatever specific nation states allow them to do, right? They still Mm -hmm. can't act above the, the reality of these borders in these states. You still have uh, national liberation movements that are happening as we speak, right? So, so that idea has not gone away at all. And I think that those are some of the times where, like I said, the academy is 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 moving faster than people are catching up because we're thinking about it in theory. We're thinking about it theoretically. We're under we're unpacking the idea that because this is an imagined community, because these are constructs 
then we should be able to sort of transcend those constructs. But when people are very much um, identify with them and are tied to them so deeply, they they have not, the masses have not joined that idea. And so I, I don't think that, not only do I think nationalisms and nation states are not going away anytime soon, I think to your point, they're resurging, right? Some of these ideas, some of them in very dangerous ways, by the way, right? Like mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. to keep in mind is when you talk about, we talk about nationalisms and national identities, um, it can have different connotations in different contexts. And sometimes it can be quite negative because it can be dangerous, right? If you're talking about chauvinist nationalism, then you're talking about very dangerous rhetoric. But like any other tool or like any other ideology, it's well, it's positivity or negativity is based on that context. And so it's uh, nationalism can be a symbol of, of you know, hate towards other groups, or it can be a symbol of resistance towards what people see as um, an oppressive power. And in the case of Iran, for instance, that's a lot of where these national narratives came from. And this is where the title of the book comes from, was in resisting, right? They were resisting uh, their oppressors, whether it be the monarchy or the Islamic Republic, and they continue to do so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that brings me to, um, you know, this idea of contesting origin stories or you know every nationalism has some sort of origin story to it and as you're saying it's it's how we relate to either an identity or a place we're from or whatever is through, is through narrative is through story and so when we contest these origin stories um you use this word anxiety in the past it brings up a lot of anxiety for people and one of the things that i sort of think a lot about with with my classrooms is um, the 1619 project in the United States, right? Where this idea of no 1776 is not the origin story of the United States. We need to go back to 1619 and all of the controversy that that that, uh, project has sort of brought about with it I think goes to point goes to show the controversy or the the feelings of anxiety that we have when our origin stories are questioned or messed with. The, the revolution brings about another origin story that is different from what the monarchy had. Um, and, uh, you know, it, um, it's about Imam Hussein and it's about sort of a particular notion of, of fighting against an oppression um, and, and the uses of martyrdom as a political act. But then when we fast forward to today, and also throughout the past 40 years, that in and of itself has also been contested multiple times, that the state and, you know, from folks who are um, op- opposing the state, that actually you are the ones that are the oppressors. It's not that you are the ones who are resisting. And so I, and what I love is that in your epilogue, you bring us up to the present moment. Um, so can you kind of get us to where your epilogue is, the the kind of contestations that you bring about there in in these current moments um, that that we're going through. And especially you, you, I think if I'm not mistaken, probably started around 2015 in your epilogue and brought us up to the 2020 moment. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I wish I could, I mean, I, I would say, I wish I could add a chapter right now, but actually I wouldn't add it right now. Right. Because it was the moment we're living through right now is one that we're still observing. And because we're, Mm -hmm we're very, very close to it, it would be difficult. I mean, you certainly can't write a history about it yet because it's, it's ongoing. ongoing. Um, But I do think, but I do think there's this sort of very interesting thing that I would love to, and really right now act as an observer in how what's happening now ties to uh, the other narratives within, within the book, especially because you have this new generation that the book doesn't deal with because the period is a very, it's a different period, right? We're dealing, I'm dealing mostly with, the post-revolutionary generation, Iranian millennials, um, people born either, you know, around or so soon after like the revolution. Um, there's a few things I want to say actually about what you were talking about. So first of all, I love the 1619 project for many reasons, but specifically because it challenged the U.S. narrative, right? Again, yeah. there's this idea that like, this is, this happens everywhere. But I thought the 1619 project was so interesting because whereas as an Iranian, I know that those competing narratives are so fresh. I mean, the revolution is something that happened in 1979. The American Revolution happened in 1776. How much do we challenge the narrative of the American Revolution? And yet here was something that did. And that to me was fascinating. And it also showed 
that the 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 sort of competing narratives and and the way that uh, narrative takes shape is certainly not unique to Iran. This is ubiquitous throughout all national projects, all nation states. And so I loved it for that specific reason because it came to to challenge the story of the United States, and and that's why it got both very positive, right? These a lot of times these narratives elicit very strong reactions and there's you know you can read into why why is there such a strong reaction to something that challenges a story why can't we you know sort of accept that there are different threads to these stories and all together they make up this larger narrative right but because it challenges certain powers it challenges certain status quos and that's why it often causes these these uh, very strong reactions to it. And so you saw that with the 1619 Project. Um, In the case of the revolution, yeah, I mean, the revolution, you look at a lot of the language that people use when they talk about just their own lives is there's this idea of uh, before and after the revolution, right? It's, It's a very everyday kind of catchphrase or like turn of phrase that's used because it is a, it's, this rupture within the society. And so it's part of the sort of psyche and the timeline of contemporary Iranians. But then you have a young generation, um, Gen Z Iranians who aren't tied to those events in the same ways. And so I would be fascinated to do field research in Iran today if possible, because I would be very curious to learn whether or not they follow the same kind of timeline. Probably likely not, right? And and we can talk about this more, but I think, you know, there's there's implications for Gen Z a- across cultures and societies. It's not just, again, it's not just Iran. In very many ways, Iranian Gen Zers parallel um, their generation outside of the country more than they do other generations within their own country. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can talk about why, you know, how the internet plays into things like that and social media and all of that. But when I wanted to add the epilogue, obviously the book is a history. And so, and it's a history of these historical narratives. Um, The anxieties that you talk about, that's exactly what I wanted to get at, that these conversations, that these uh, narratives cause anxieties for people because of how much psychologically they're tied to certain identities, right? I mean, if you look at the uh, debate, for instance, around the flag, like how, how passionate people can be about a flag. And I'm not, I'm not reducing its symbolism to say that it's not an important symbol, but if you just remove yourself for a minute from the emotion and think about the fact that this piece of fabric and the symbol within it can elicit such strong reactions from people, that's fascinating in and of itself, right? Like we're, we're, we're still trying to navigate why it's so difficult to accept competing narratives. Oftentimes people want to say this is the narrative and that comes from the state. And sometimes when that type of nationalism is elicited, it comes from people as well. People will will echo that kind of ownership of the narrative. Like my narrative is the correct narrative and yours is inauthentic. And we act almost the same way that the state does because we wanna control and wield that narrative. That's also a process of resistance though, right? So. What was interesting about the Islamic Republic specifically is one of the things it promotes, and it does so openly, this isn't like, I'm not theorizing it. They say everything is called, I mean, right now it's like under sanctions, they call it a resistance economy. Um, They promote resistance culture. This is openly said. Um, And so certain political discourse that the Islamic Republic exploits and capitalizes on are resistance movements within the region, right? Why, for instance, there's so much use of the discourse of Palestinian liberation because it is this uh, globally known movement towards the liberation of a people and therefore it's resistance and they and they tie themselves to these resistance movements. Um, the Islamic Republic uses language of Black Lives Matter, Malcolm X, civil rights uh, leaders within the United States. Again, why? Because they're trying to maintain this narrative of themselves as this continuous revolutionary state. And they use the the story of martyrdom of Imam Hussein because 
that story is not is not unique, by the way, to Shiite lore, right? It's it's very similar and parallel in other cultures, like the David and Goliath story, or the Battle of Thermopylae and three hundred Spartans um, going to war against thousands of Persian soldiers. So these types of stories of you know the underdog, so to speak, are ubiquitous within different cultures as well. But they lend themselves, as we've seen in the other cases, they lend themselves to very revolutionary language and discourse and and sentiment. And so they use that. But Hamid Daboshi actually, I thought, had a really fascinating argument in his book, Shiaism, where he says the, the sort of like the issue with using this kind of language and this kind of lore for a state like the Islamic Republic is Imam Hussein is successful in his failure, right? He fails. I mean, he's martyred, he's killed. But it's through his martyrdom, it's through his his standing up against the oppressor, even if he failed to overthrow the oppressor, that he is successful. But once you overthrow the oppressor, you become the oppressor. And that is in, in a certain sense, the story of the Islamic Republic. And so it constantly still tries to promote this idea of resistance, but in doing so, it's also gives space to Iranian people to resist, right? They appropriate and co-opt that back from the state. They take it back. Uh, because because they are also resisting, and whether they were resisting the 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 oppressive nature of the monarchy to whether they're op- uh, resisting the oppressive nature of the Islamic Republic, they continue that sort of uh, resistance. And so, for the Islamic Republic, it becomes this double-edged sword where they try to promote it, but at the same time, they're promoting something that becomes a rallying cry for people in the country who are seeking certain freedoms and liberations themselves against what is now the oppressive force, which is the Islamic Republic. Right. And 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 right now, I love how you laid that all out. It was really brilliantly done. And, and right now they're having such a hard time from their perspective, regaining a certain kind of narrative control precisely because of this, right? Like how do they say that they are on the side of the uh on the side of those who are being oppressed when they are the ones doing so much of the killing and and the the um the repression of desires for a different form of politics a different form of being um you say on page 50 um and i want to follow up on on this conversation with this on page 50 you write when the image of the shah as a foreign imposition reached its climax the call for his overthrow became a revolutionary slogan for national independence um and you tie it very much throughout the piece and you or throughout your art throughout your book and you're drawing upon different scholars like abraham yon Dapashi and others who are arguing about um, the national that national independence and national sovereignty is sort of the thorough line throughout Iran's modern history of 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 um, throughout these past hundred years or so. Um, so what caught me what caught my eye on this was not just the historical moment of the Shah and when he becomes the. Um, when 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 there's that climax of him as a foreign leader that you know it's sort of like they cannot hold back the gates any longer to the revolutionary moment and and the narrative of it and it reminded me a lot or it got me thinking a lot about how i'm seeing a similar kind of narrative being developed today in in relation to these uprisings in iran uh, from opposition forces which is that the islamic republic is an occupying force um because for the longest time, those who have opposed the Islamic Republic have had a very difficult time tying it into being an, a, a, a force somehow that's foreign to Iran because the Islamic Republic has tried for so long and in many ways has been able to um, trace its roots to Iranian religious history and different forms of history in the, in, in, in uh, Iran. And now you're seeing a counter narrative to that. Um, and so, and your epilogue also got me thinking along that because you're showing how the contestation over these nationalist narratives in Iran, especially over the past half decade, are so the fight back and forth is happening in such successive moments to one another. Um, so I wanted to get your thoughts on that, and and particularly in this uh, present moment that we're in. Yeah, well, I actually think when I try to historically contextualize this moment, I take it back to the Constitutional Revolution, right? And and that might seem like a stretch, but the idea, and obviously I'm a historian and that's one of the reasons, but it's because ultimately what people want 
in the country is a government that serves its people and is representative of those people. And that's an idea that was um, brought into Iran long before the 1979 revolution. Uh, long, you know, it, it's, its roots go back to the 19th century. And a lot of it is European influence, right? It's pe- students going to, from under the Rajar dynasty, going to Europe to study and bringing certain ideas that are developing in Europe at the time as well, like constitutionalism. And by the early 20th century, that idea takes real hold, right? It takes shape in Iran because while the constitutional revolution fails to overthrow the monarchy, it is successful at instituting a constitution. And more than that, it's successful at creating this idea of constitutionalism. And sometimes when we think of revolutionary moments or when we think of, you know, even if we're thinking about this moment right now, like what is a success? And and sometimes I think we think of those terms very black and white, like unless you get, it's either all or nothing. And for, and I think the constitutional revolution is, is a really great example of how, well, it was a failure and a success. And how does that happen? Because it failed at one thing, but it succeeded at something else. And those seeds, planting those seeds, having a population that becomes conscious of this idea that they can, they deserve and can in fact have a government that is representative of their needs, is so important. And that roots back all the way to the early 20th century. And so what you're seeing today in my mind is still, is that continuous struggle. Uh, Whether it was in the 1940s when more, you know, part of the the democratic sort of aspirations of Iranians and the most, I would argue, the most uh, democratic period in Iranian history is really between 1941 and 1953, where there's more space for, for political discourse. Um, that was tied to that became tied to the nationalization of oil and sort of a anti anti imperialist in the sense that it was anti control of Iranian resources, whereas Iran wasn't formally colonized, but still its resources were colonized. So in these different iterations, you have different successes, right? It's again not entirely victorious because something thwarts it eventually, but. Um, But it is successful at, again, creating these national, this kind of national consciousness and this idea that, oh, not only should our government be representative, but our resources should belong to us. So throughout this history, you see these things that develop. So Iran's national independence becomes a very, very important concept. And this is why both the Pahlavi monarchs and the, um, especially Mohammad Reza Pahlavi and the Islamic Republic use that discourse of independence, right? Both claim to um, be independent from foreign powers, uh, whereas Iran was under the, the, you know, the control of foreign powers. Both will argue this. Um, but what brings us to, to this moment in competing narratives, absolutely, of course, you still have, those narratives have never gone away, and those anxieties have never gone away. Um, there's a, there was a graphic, actually, uh, that's in the book, uh, in, I think, the second chapter, which is about the, um, Islamic Republic, the the net narrative building of the Islamic Republic. And what the artist had done is it's a very short video. And the video starts out with this sort of miniature, very classic uh, Iranian uh, art. It's very colorful. You have a woman in the center, her hair is showing. And over the course of the video, this is turns black and white. These strips come down to black and white. The woman is covered entirely uh, with a chador and um, you have black and white pictures of martyrs basically in the background. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, that spoke to the anxieties that Iranians had very early on after the revolution. Uh, if you look at where we are today with these protests, the fact that what sparked them, obviously they've evolved, but what sparked them was the killing of Gina Masa Amini. And so it was centered around the hijab, the compulsory hijab. Um, those anxieties and those protests originally started in 1979, right? So, so the types of resistance we're seeing today, the things that are being resisted today have been resisted throughout, right? Iranians have, but they've done it in different ways. And so what I think you're seeing today is a different style of resistance, the type of civil disobedience that you're seeing um, combined with a new generation that's come to the political scene and the narrative is part of that as well. How do you how do you thwart a revolutionary a, a narrative from the state that claims to be this revolutionary state that claims to um, not only promote resistance culture within its right? That's that's still the narrative that they're giving you. 
these aren't organic protests. These are foreign backed protests. And what does that mean? They have to resist. So they're still using that narrative. So how do you combat that? You have to create your own narrative of resistance. And I think the idea of it being the perception of an occupying force is sort of a fascinating way to do that, right? Because you can, if you can wield that narrative, then you can create this idea of how you would resist it. And perception, I think, is something that we don't think about very much either, right? But when I talk about the Shah, when I talk about the former Shah, there's this, I, I say that there's this, I, there's a perception that he is tied to foreign powers, and this dates back to the coup of 1953. Now, there's more recently a lot of debates, we'll say, in the in the history of what was the reality and what was the perception. But in terms of narratives, it's the perception that's important. Even if you wanted to uh, sort of debate the history, it is how people perceive things that is important mm -hmm. because that's what the story is, right? You, to a certain extent, we're all storytellers. And right now, what narrative is building uh, is very important in how Iranian people can resist uh, the Islamic Republic. Right, and and this is why, you know, in these discussions of people are like, we're living in these post-truth societies and if you just give people the facts, they'll they'll get the facts. And it's like, no, people, people understand stories. It's not about facts and it's about narrative control, which is what your book, I think, does such a brilliant job of showing in the Iranian case. Um, we're unfortunately running out of time, but before we get to that point where we're running out of time, I want to ask you, who did you write this book for? Like, who's your, who's your ideal audience for this book? I really wanted to write something that would, so as someone who was Iranian American, right, as someone who grew up in the United States of Iranian heritage, I always felt like there was so much misperception um, and misperception, misperception exists on both sides, of course. But for me as an American, it was always like, well, it's like I had to explain away something about Iran. And I really wanted something that was academic, but distilled in a way that anybody could read it and have an understanding of contemporary Iran, as well as the diversity of that country, right? That's one of the things that I thought was the most important part of the story to tell was to, to me. And that's what I said myself at the end. I, I wanted to tell a story too. Like this is, this is, this is another story. Um, it's not, it's not the story. It's a story. And I would encourage people who read this book to read many other books on the topic as well. But what I really wanted to get across was a certain understanding from oh, in a way that's palatable to a Western audience and people who don't necessarily know that much about Iran. I wanted them to understand um, both its own contemporary society, but also just the diversity and richness of that history. Yeah, and I, I think you do it well, Asad. Uh, this book, I highly recommend it to, to folks, uh, whether you are not in academia, and if, if you are in academia, and especially if you're an educator, I think this book will do really, really well in the classroom too. So I, I want to congratulate you on the publication of the book, on writing such a compelling um, study of nationalism and national identity and of bringing us up to the present moment uh, in doing so and, and really contending to both the top down and the bottom up contestations over all of these issues in Iran. Um, I wish we could keep talking. I wish there was more time because there's so much in here I've highlighted and I want to discuss with you, but I uh, really just want to thank you for your time and thank you for putting this book together and really recommend it for those who are watching and listening. Thanks, thank you, Dr. Thank you so Asad Thank you. Thank you for, for having me and for having this uh, great discussion. It, uh, it, it brought back a lot of memories of working on the book, which I very much enjoyed doing. So I hope more people will uh, have a chance to, to read it and, and engage with the discussion. Yeah, thank you all for joining us. Um, wishing everyone a wonderful end to their 2022. And here's to hoping for uh, more peace and serenity in 2024.